This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We end today's show looking at a major new Washington Post expose titled Money War, How Four U.S. Presidents Unleashed Economic Warfare Across the Globe. The Post reporting examines how the U.S. has increasingly relied on economic sanctions that have left collateral damage across the globe. The Post expose begins saying, quote, today the United States imposes three times as many sanctions as any other country or international body, targeting a third of all nations with some kind of financial penalty on people, properties or organizations. But the collateral damage of the sanctions is seldom discussed. The Washington Post reports in Venezuela, which just held a contested election, sanctions have contributed to an economic contraction roughly three times as large as that caused by the Great Depression in the United States. The Post also reports Donald Trump was warned sanctions on Venezuela could result in millions of people migrating from Venezuela. We're joined now by Jeff Stein, co-author of The Washington Post Exposé and White House economics reporter for The Post. Why don't you take it from there, Jeff? In this five minutes that we have together, talk about making the Venezuelan economy scream. We'll go from the effect of sanctions on Venezuela and then go to other countries. Yeah, so starting under the Obama administration, the U.S. began imposing sanctions on Venezuela. But at first, they were very limited. They were really just focused on a few members of the Maduro regime that were responsible for carrying out violent reprisals against protesters in Venezuela. But really under Trump, and as we exclusively reported in this story, despite the warnings of DHS officials in classified reports about the potential outmigration effects of these sanctions, the, the Trump administration really choked off the main source of export revenue, 96 percent of Venezuela's export revenue comes from oil sales. And what the U.S. Eff effectively did over the course of three to four years was to block those sales from occurring in international markets. And that really strangled the joint ventures that were sort of the lifeblood of the Venezuelan economy. This means sort of the, the oil deals that were worked out with U.S. producers, with the Venezuelans, that were providing them with the revenue that they needed to buy sort of imports from other countries. And when that happened, you saw a, a, the numbers are just staggering. 71 percent economic contraction in Venezuela, as, as you mentioned, three times as great as the U.S. Great Depression and greater than any other peacetime economic collapse recorded in modern history, greater than many other um, economic collapses of, of countries at war, including Ukraine in, in, after the Russian invasion or Iraq after the U.S. invasion in 2003. So this is a cataclysmic event. And, and economists go back and forth, and it seems clear to me from my reporting that the, the economic collapse in Venezuela predates U.S. sanctions. Econo uh, you know, Venezuela had inflation of over 800 percent before Trump really tightened the screws on the Venezuelan economy. But there is also no doubt that these U.S. measures made the economic situation in Venezuela worse. And at the, at the cost of um, but, and, and while despite that cost did not push out Maduro's government, who and obviously Maduro still remains in power today. So can you say, Jeff, I mean, uh, if this is Venezuela's case, but also elsewhere, how effective have U.S. economic sanctions been? I mean, there was a time, uh, which you point out in the piece, with apartheid South Africa, uh, sanctions helped bring down end apartheid. Also in, in Serbia, uh, the demise of uh, Milosevic's uh, regime, also through sanctions or partially through sanctions. But what about now? Now, I think it's, it's really hard to say. Academic attempts to sort of isolate the effects of sanctions and whether they have worked or not are very hard to quantify. Some studies I've seen suggest that the success rate is between 15 and 30 percent, which, given that we have sanctions now in some form on roughly a third of all nations and 60 percent of all poor countries, suggests a very high failure rate. Um, we, we look in the piece at Cuba, Iran, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Syria. These are, are tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people who are being affected in some form by U.S. sanctions, where the regimes that the U.S. are intending to target have not changed hands, have not surrendered their hold on power. And maybe, you know, the U.S. will say that these sanctions are still better than not having any measures because they deprive these regimes of funds at their disposal that they can use for, you know, what the U.S. would say are perni pernicious activities, activities that the U.S. does not want to see. But, 
at the same time, in terms of actually leading to changes of regime, we don't really see that very much. And, and many critics will argue that, in fact, sanctions actually em embolden and empower the, the people in charge, these regimes in charge, because they curb civil society, they reduce the, the power and the clout of private sector actors that often form a rival power base to the sanctioning, sanctioned authority that these regimes in charge. And so, in case after case, we see um, very legitimate, it seems, criticisms of, of these um, sanctions regimes. And what about Iran, uh, to say the least, very much in the news today? Uh, the effect of the U.S. sanctions, and also how, when the U.S. imposes sanctions, they also pressure other countries to do the same, of course, as we see in Cuba. Yeah, the Iran sanctions um, really uh, first imposed in, in really dramatic effect in 2010 through uh, measures passed by o the Obama administration and Congress really amounted to a, a fascinating expansion of U.S. sanction authority, where we really saw in, in a very significant way the first deployment of secondary sanctions, which were to say, we're not just sanctioning the party that we, we don't like here, but we're also going to say, if you engage with measure in, in trade with the Iranian regime, we will target you. And, and so that effectively represented a major expansion uh, of sanctioning power and really um, seemed to the advocates of sanctions to be a very effective approach because, obviously, in 2015, the Obama administration worked with the Iranian regime on a nuclear deal that, that sanctions advocates hailed as the product of this pressure campaign. That said, the U.S. under Trump you know, pulled out of that, that deal. And so any people who say that, that the Iranian sanctions um, under Obama were successful have to contend with the fact that, that we abandoned as a country that deal quite quickly and left the Iranians um, in the lurch and have since then seen the Iranians work with Russia, work with, um, you know, uh, the Cubans, work with other powers that the U.S. is opposed to on forming rival um, financial networks that leave open the question of whether there's even the possibility of further Iran sanctions being effective now that they've formed all these rival sort of trading networks that operate sort of as a shadow um, trade system to what the U.S., um, the sort of Western financial system that is, is the predicate for punishing Iran via sanctions. And Jeff, very quickly, we have 30 seconds. What happened to the 2021 plan uh, to overhaul the U.S. sanction system? Yeah, we exclusively report in our story that a group of Treasury staffers had dr a draft of a report far more extensive than what they ultimately released. They had dozens of recommendations, um, including measures really meant to check the rise of U.S. sanctions, particularly a, a, a sort of central coordinator. Right now, it's a little bureaucratic, but there are sort of many parts of the government that sort of throw out sanctions ideas. They get rolled together in State Department and Treasury Department sanctions and push forward. And there's really no one body that sort of is evaluating whether these sanctions are operating in the context of um, an overall broader sanction strategy. And Treasury staffers draw, drew up a plan to say, like, let's put that in place. But disagreements with the State Department, sort of the overall inertia of sanctions, where they seem so easy, so effective, they seem to the U.S. government much easier than going to war, much easier than doing nothing, or much more politically palatable than doing nothing. And so that plan was shelved. And really, under the, the Biden administration, we've just seen more and more sanctions. Biden has imposed 6,000 sanctions in two years, an unprecedented sum. And the fact we, that that has continued really reflects the inability of the U.S. to get this problem or to get this number down. Jeff Stein, we thank you so much for being with us. Reporter for The Washington Post will link to your piece, How Four U.S. Presidents Unleashed Economic Warfare Across the Globe. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh.